Hello subscribers. I had had a few requests to go over some of the Forteverse code for the RPG that I'm working on and so I decided to do that. Um, so basically I'm using Java as the back end and Java's been around a long time. Came about I think roughly around 1995 was when it was kind of invented. But uh, I've been using it since 1999, so I've been using it a really long time. It's extremely robust and stable. It can run on pretty much any kind of platform. In fact, uh, the Android operating system is pretty much Java. It's uh, maybe a special form of Java, but nevertheless, it uh, pretty much is. So. It can do pretty much anything you want it to do. Now that's all on the server. Now this is a multiplayer, massive multiplayer online RPG. And so you, you have what's called threads that execute on servers. Now of course, basically I'm going to try to give you a really quick lesson on threads and what they are. But you've probably heard of the term a process. Well, a process is essentially an application or a program that's running. And generally, processes and applications have multiple threads. Even if those threads aren't really doing anything, they're kind of standby, they actually execute. So in the old days, when you only had one processor, only one thread could execute at a time. But with hyper-threading and multi-processor machines and multi-core, these threads can actually execute at the same time, like tr real time. Now, in the old days, it used to do what's called multi -pro or multitasking or the operating system. It still does, but the operating system can't load all the threads that are in memory into the CPU to execute. So it has to cycle through them and give each a little share depending on their on their priority. That's how at least modern uh, operating systems have worked the past 20 years. So anyway, Java is excellent at that. It makes it great to be able to control. And um, there's other languages, of course, that can do the same thing. But um, I have very, very extensive experience with Java and C Sharp. Uh, but C Sharp is a Microsoft technology and Java's uh, currently owned by Oracle, but it started Sun Microsystems. Okay, so enough of that boring stuff. Let's get to the coding. So the game is backed by a database, which of course is uh, uses a language called SQL, SQL. You've probably heard of that before. So I've created my own framework many years ago when I made my own business in 2004. And so I use a lot of my framework for the game. And just over the years, I've built up more and more Java utility type classes for my main products. And so I've created this thing a long time ago called Database Engine, which is generic, and it can access any kind of database I want. Uh, right now, the database I'm storing this in is a pure Java database called HSQLDB. But eventually, once it goes live, it'll be on a larger, more robust type database. And for ease, easeability right now, I'll probably use SQL Server, which is a Microsoft product, but uh, I could switch it to anything I want. If I want it to be a DB2, Oracle, MySQL, it could be any of those. So let's show you some of the tables that the code actually loads records into. There's a lot of tables. So probably what I'm going to do is load up browse the database here and we'll just give you kind of a rundown on the majority of them give you a feel for what the game is using and storing so here's an HSQL database manager so that we can see all the different tables and examine the contents and if I look at the code you can see the first table I'm creating is called ES underscore race. I title all tables with ES underscore just because it makes it unique then in case these tables were stored in a different type of database with other tables. I don't plan on that, but 
that's just a convention. So let's take a look at what records we've inserted into this table already with code. So we're going to do a SQL statement, select star from ES race, and this is going to pull back all the records. In fact, let's order it by name so that we can have it listed alphabetically. So the first column in this uh, table is called ID. It's just every table is going to have a unique ID. And I use what's called a GUID, or some people call it a GUID. But basically, it's a globally unique identifier. And that allows, there's, there's a lot of reasons behind that, but basically it allows the databases to be replicated and unique anywhere. So it's very powerful, although there is a slight performance drop by using these GUIDs instead of integers, but it's worth the trade-off, especially for a large uh, system like this. So as you can see, here's just a bunch of races I have in here. Some are more generic than others, like animal, that's a generic. Um, I've indicated whether or not they are player eligible. So what that means is can a player create a character of this type? And some of them, no, you can't. It doesn't mean you can't get them in your party with summoning spells and other things and charm. But for creation of characters, they always have to be some type of humanoid. So as you can see, we have a ton of races here. And the default age, I haven't actually done anything with that yet. I just set them all to 18. But certain races, just like in other RPGs, will have different max and mins. And the max age, of course, will impact how long that character can be alive without some kind of rejuvenation spell. And all of my tables, I put a column for create, and last time it was updated, just for uh, tracking and auditing purposes. So let's go back and look at the code. So, all we're doing is creating a first table, and then here I'm putting some indexes. Indexes basically just speed up access to the table on certain columns that you know you're going to be accessing frequently. Now, small tables, you don't even really need those, but uh, I do it anyway because when you're joining a bunch of tables together to with a big statement, it really helps. Okay, so I, I put a lot of comments in Java in my code, especially when I've thought of something I want to do, but I'm not ready to implement it yet. And you have to be that way when you're working on something large like this on your own, because otherwise you'll just go nuts and you'll forget what you were going to do. Sometimes I'll put what's called a to-do tag. For example, I just searched for one there. And this is in relation to event action requirements. So I put a little to-do statement in here from my own knowledge that says, have to be careful not to get an infinite loop here when implemented. So that's just a reminder to myself to use this properly and not have events trigger the same events over and over where it goes into an infinite loop. So that's all that that's about. But as you can see, I've just coded into one of my Java classes here, one I appropriately called Game Engine SQL, just all the different tables that are going to be created. Like here's vocation skills. So this defines all the skill probabil or possibilities for a given vocation. Vocation is my term for class, like a character class. It's more generic. Class is a little bit of a weird term for me because it, it almost makes it sound like, you know, are you low class, are you high class, are you poor, are you rich? And I wanted to get away from that and have it more about your interest and what's your character's primary interest. Now you can change vocations in the game, but uh, basically each vocation has a fixed number of skills that they have the ability to use. And so if let, let's just look for, let's say the uh, warrior. I got to go to my preload class for that. All right, so the warrior 
has all kinds of different skills. They have pain tolerance, <clears throat> melee attack, range attack, throwing attack. Now, all classes can attack, or all vocations can attack, but these are bonuses with those types of attacks. Sword weapons, mace weapons, hammer weapons. So they can specialize with those things to get better with them. So the warrior is the vocation that has the most number of weapon and attack skills to choose from. So you can really make this guy or girl great with everything, or you can make them, you know, specialize with a certain type of thing in the beginning and then switch it over. But as you can see, they can even specialize with two-handed melee versus simultaneous melee. So having two weapons at once. Shielding skill, parrying. Parrying means you're actively using your weapon, if it has a parry ability, to try to block off an attack that's coming toward you. Where shielding is literally using a shield. And then specialize with padded leather or cloth armor so that they don't get slowed down as much or lose as many attributes with those equipped. So I might as well just talk about this while I'm here. And this is, this is going to be all over the place because I look at one thing and then it leads me to another. But with all skills, basically, you can see here what I'm doing is in the main engine of the game, I'm, I created this special method called generate vocation skill and it takes a list of all the master skills so every single skill and then I tell it a specific skill I'm looking for and then I say the minimum value that the warrior will start with is a zero on that and the absolute maximum the warrior can get with that particular skill is 200 and when the skill is used how much does it go up by so this skill, like stick weapons, for example, will go up by 0.1 every time it's used. So in other words, if you attack with a stick weapon, it's going to go up by 0.1. Now there probably will be uh, an exponential factor on that. So as the skill, in fact, I think I already programmed that in there. As the skill gets higher and higher, this number will actually drop. This is just what it is initially every time you use it. So let's jump to this generate vocation skill. And I'm using a IDE for Java called Eclipse. So all you have to do is right click on the method and say open declaration. And it jumps me to that method in the class. So in here you can see it's very simple. All it's doing is taking all those parameters I passed in and it's looping through these skills and it's trying to find the one with that name. And it sets the min and max and the name and the usage rate. So very, very simple. But let's go back to the SQL again. So um, all of these tables I was talking about earlier, they get preloaded by code. So the code that's doing that is this class I created called Game Engine SQL Preload. So the first time this database is created, it's empty. And so all the tables get created, and then all of this data that I want to go in there gets inserted right off the bat. And that's what this class does. So let's just take a look at some of the methods and what they do. Here, for example, we're inserting all the resistance types for the game. So I showed in a previous Forteverse update all the different resistances and the hierarchy to it. That's what this defines. So basically, like energy is at a high root where it's at a root. So there might be some other resistances underneath energy. Like, for example, any type of physical is under energy, and any type of mental is under energy. But there's another resistance type called spiritual, which is not energy, it's different. So in other words, it's not in the physical world, it's not in our universe. And so it's a different type of resistance. So ghosts, for example, 
may be completely immune to either energy or physical. I'm not sure yet on this. I'm probably going to make it physical. But I really need to contemplate what I want ghosts and spirits to actually be. But anyway, obviously they could be affected by spiritual type resistances. But anything under physical, they'd be immune to because they're immune to that higher level. So let's see what is physical. Physical force, nervous system force, circulatory system force, respiratory system force, stamina force, temperature, chemical. You can see there's all kinds of them. They're physical. So anything that's immune to that can't be impacted by any spell or any type of weapon or attack that would use any of these. So this is preloading all the resistances. You can see there's quite a few. And we'll just go down the line here. Next we have uh, what I call event action types. So as you do things in the game, whether it's stepping somewhere, talking with someone, attacking something, there's a chance that there could be an event that's going to fire or be triggered at that point. And I've just come up with a small list right now of different types of events that I'm going to have in the game and that they're going to do something. So, for example, I may display some text. So it, maybe if you step on a certain square, maybe you're, you should be told, you know, you see some runes on the wall in the dungeon. Well, I would use the display text event. Maybe I want to display a picture at that same time. So that's what that event would be for. Maybe I want to play a couple sounds, like some different music or a sound effect. I can do that. Maybe you completed a quest and I need to give you experience for that. Or maybe you uh, attacked somebody that you shouldn't have attacked that was a good person and I feel like taking away some experience. You know, that, that's a possibility. So that's what all these event types are. Uh, maybe I just trigger an event that's more complicated that will cascade to other events. So there's just a whole slew of those. And then there's even some generic uh, kind of global things that I plan on having in many different places in the game, like shops. All, you know, I want all shops to have a standard interface so that when you go in there, you know, it'll present, what do you want to do? Are you going to buy? Are you going to sell? What, what's the inventory for the shop? Uh, so that this is a special shop. Think of like Bard's Tale, for example, and you go into Garth's weapon shop. <clears throat> It'd be like that, you know, where I just trigger a certain shop event and I pick which shop it is. Same with temples and all kinds of other build <clears throat> buildings, banks, the uh, vocation. Oh, what's it called now? It's aristocrat. They uh, can own a house. They start with a house. So you could uh, go into your house and rest or store things there. And I did show that in a previous Forteverse uh, update in case you missed that. So anyway, that's what all that stuff's about. Now, here's the trigger types for those events, because there's different types of ways those can be triggered. Maybe each second you're standing in a certain area, it's going to trigger. Or each minute you're standing within that area will trigger. An example of the second might be lava. If you're standing in lava... Obviously, I'm going to want you to take damage every second until you get out of there. So that's what the, this would be about. There's going to be other time-sensitive ones like once per party within the area. I can even do once per player within the area uh, because you may have multiple parties. And so um, maybe the player is only going to get something to happen to them one time and they'll never get it again. So that's what that's about. Maybe it's only when you move to an area or um, you move to an area and there's no other events happening. So all these different things. Uh, context option triggered actually means when the player clicks the context button. There's a little context button in the game. And when you click that, 
sometimes different things will happen. You'll, you'll have different choices depending on the context that you're in, like where you're at, what's happening around you. So it's kind of a variable menu, and that's what that will be. Or possibly triggered when you try to parlay with someone. And I'm sure I'm going to come up with other types, but that's what I have right now. All right, let's see what else we got. Component types, okay. So all objects, almost all objects in the game, are made up of components. For example, a sword will have a handle and a blade. A quarter staff is just going to have a base. A mace will have a base and a head. Same with like an axe. You know, if you're holding an axe, normally you just have a base. It's just like a, it's just wood. And then the head may be something else. So that's what all this stuff's for. Uh, flails, for example, we might have a chain. A string might exist for a bow or a musical instrument. Um, let's see, container, like a vial of ink. And then ink, for example, is a liquid content of that container. So there'll probably be more of those, but there's a reason why they're split up that way. Then we have target types. So when you go to cast a spell or do some type of action, whether it's a skill, using a skill or whatever, there's different types of things you can invoke that on. You could choose to invoke it on a life form, maybe a spirit or a soul, or it could be something like an item. Items, the most generic high level object for a non life form. A weapon is a specific type of item. Same with like footwear, that's a specific type of item. So if a given spell impacts an item, it could impact any of these. Whereas maybe there's a certain spell like uh, Boots of Speed, that's a spell that can be cast. That can only be cast on footwear. So that's why there's different target types. Uh, sometimes it might be a structure, like it could be a wall, or maybe there's a, a giant boulder, that, and maybe you can target that to get it out of the way. A location, that's really generic because basically you cast it at a certain position, and depending on what's there, it may behave differently. Like normally location-based things, targets are for spells, like a fireball that'll hit an area or a hailstorm where the, the stones are going to come down in a big area. So you target a location. Some spells will only target self or maybe some skills. And there's a type called a self aura. So if you're familiar with certain games, they have some of them will have auras which radiate around the uh, caster. Like, for example, in Dungeons & Dragons, the Paladin had an aura of protection from evil. Or if you're familiar with Warcraft 3, the Paladin there has a divorce, uh, devotion aura, which gives armor bonus to everyone around him. So as the, tar as the uh, caster moves around, the aura follows him. So that's what that's about. Uh, you could maybe have a spell that will impact a different life form and give them an aura. And then you could maybe target a party. So in my game, I don't have what's called a group. So in most games, you know, you'll have like a group of five goblins and there's a group of seven Komodo dragons. So there'd be two groups. I just call it a party. A party is more generic because a party could be huge where it has, you know, 200 things in it, or you could have a couple parties and they're just venturing together. So it's, it's pretty much the same thing as a group. So there might be one party that has those five goblins and Komodo dragons in it together, or it could be two parties and they're, to, and they're fighting you together, but then they would show up as two separate groups, essentially. So just for more flexibility and control because most games won't allow mixing and matching of 
life form types in the same party. Like it's just going to have them listed separately. Three and five. Well, in mine, it could be three comma five. Or it could be three and five. Okay, so enough about all that. Let's see. Reputation types. Okay. So reputation types, the intent on this is as you perform actions in the game, you're going to start earning, <laughs> whether you like it or not, reputation. So the biggest example I can give you is the reputation of hostile. If you attack someone and they weren't expecting it, you're going to get a hostile relationship with that particular party. So if it's just one person, it's just going to be the one person. If there's five other people in that party, you're going to make all of them hostile. And then they're going to probably attack you. It's They're going to remember, most life forms will remember for a long time that you were hostile. And so if you ever leave and come back, they're probably going to attack you, call for help or something. Now, there will be spells and things that you can do to potentially undo some hostile recognition, but it will be a little bit limited. But anyway, that's what all of these things are about. As you perform actions, like let's say you did something really kind for someone, that may increase your polite reputation with them. And since this is a big RPG and it's multiplayer, there's going to be all kinds of reputations and rumors and things spreading around towns and eventually it may spread to other towns but it's going to be really cool it's going to be kind of like tabletop gaming where it's very in depth and way beyond what uh, any other game I've ever played that's an online RPG like this where your relationship with others could impact something different like in a different place in the game or much later on and so if you have a reputation for being rude, then you may actually get along better with certain people like uh, maybe dwarves that are crude and rude. Maybe you, that actually makes you respected in their eyes because maybe their personality is rude. But then the elves won't like you because, you know, they're either pompous or polite or honorable. So lots I'm really excited about how reputation is going to work, and uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. Here's just another example, a fugitive. Like let's say you broke a law in a town and you become a fugitive. That will start spreading, especially to guards and other people in the town. Think of like, uh, what's the name of that game? Darklands. And how if you go into a town, you try to sneak past the guards and you get caught and all this, it's going to be kind of similar. You know, you can become a fugitive in a given town. Or maybe you're wanted dead or alive, and some bounty hunters are going to come after you. So, lots of fun. Let's see. These, uh, these are related to spell casting for the most part. Just trying to control how the spell casting is going to go. So, there's not too much to talk about that. Uh, same with travel types. So when you cast a spell, or there's other attack types, like maybe a dragon breathing, the magical effect can go forward with different in different ways. Instant means the target is instantly hit, and there's nothing that can block it. Line means... Um, a fireball is an example of a line. Let's say you tried to target someone over here and there's a wall in the way and you're standing here and you cast a spell and it goes straight with the line effect. It'll hit this wall and it's going to stop and it's going to do damage to the wall. Continuous line means it's going to keep going. So it'll blast through that and it'll keep going. So it's going to keep its magic effect going on anything in the way. So it'll just keep on going until it reaches the target. And then cone is like in Wizardry 8, if you cast a cone spell, it just spreads out. So in the 
toward the caster, it's real narrow, and then the area increases as it goes outward. So those are the current travel types I have. Okay, then we got resource types. There's four types of money in the game. Copper, which is the cheapest. They got silver, gold, and platinum. And that's just money. And then there's all kinds of other things like scrolls, books, chemicals, um, melee weapons, ranged weapons, musical instruments, armor. That's all that that's defining. And then I'm going to have requirement types for anything, quests or whatever. So that's what all this stuff's about. So I can make dynamic quests. Okay, and then I'm, here I'm dealing with saying what types of things can a base, like maybe a base of a staff or a weapon be made out of. And there's certain types of materials like bronze, steel, hardened steel, iron, hardwood, copper, tin, softwood. So I'm controlling all that with code. And remember, all this stuff's getting preloaded. That's the intention of this class. This code is only going to run one time. And it's when the game's created, it puts all this in the database. Let's go back to it. So, like, let's look at uh, the composition type. I must have spelled it wrong. Comp position type oh it's es underscore composition type okay so there you there you can see all the different uh, types I was telling you about bronze I put hardness because that's going to be very important for attacking and defending for weapons and armor or things that are just in the way like walls a hardened stone wall let's say someone casts a, a stone wall spell all that's going to impact the amount of damage certain weapons and armor take when they strike each other uh, because they all have structure points to them. So that's what all this stuff's about. And then I include something called price per pound because various items you find in the game are going to have different composition types. And... they have a base price based on what they do normally and some things are assumed to be a certain type like most weapons are assumed to be either hardwood or steel and so if we compare for example uh, let's just take a look at bronze bronze price per pound is 100 so if something weighs eight pounds and that's it you're not looking at any other effect it's going to cost an additional 800 copper pieces just on that alone let's say you find a diamond dagger and it weighs one pound it looks like that's two hundred thousand yeah is it two hundred thousand one two three four five yeah so one pound of a, a diamond dagger will be 200,000 copper alone just for that composition. So that's what this is all about. So pretty cool. Okay, let's go back to the code. So uh, let me take a look at what else. Okay. There are going to be some unique, one-of-a-kind items in this game. Some will be randomly generated, and there's going to be multiple types. And because of the vast number of different item types that can be generated in this game, there's going to be hundreds of thousands. So even though some people could potentially run across the same random item, just based on luck and stuff, it's probably going to be pretty rare for some more powerful ones, but I'm explicitly making some unique one of a kind where there's only going to be one and only one player will ever get it. And it, and it may switch hands at some point if they sell it or that party member dies and someone else finds it. But it, to me, that's really exciting because I'm going to have all kinds of unique ones like that. 
And that, that makes it so much more like a tabletop game because I'm going to personally be injecting these items in certain like epic quests and all kinds of things. And the first player to, to find it or beat it or do something a certain way will get that item. So it's going to be really cool rewards. But the first one you see I have here is Excalibur. So Excalibur has a chance of <clears throat> executing a special spell that's unique called Excalibur Stone when you hit someone. So this is a special trigger type called Invoke Spell on Hit. And it will potentially turn that creature to stone permanently. And another thing that Excalibur can do is cast a Lightning Bolt spell. And um, it has 10 charges of that. So just some cool, cool things related to this item. Uh, but yeah, that's what I'll be doing. And once the database is loaded, I'm going to be using a special tool to just insert these items into the database while the game's up and running. And, you know, I'm going to be putting quests in, I'm going to be putting these items in, and they'll be there. Shoot, I may even decide to just have fun and put one into a shop at some point. Like maybe some shop that people rarely visit and just say, hey, you know what, I'm going to reward someone that makes it here and goes here. I'm going to put this really cool item in here. And whoever finds it, finds it. All right, item types. All kinds of item types. I don't want to go through all these, but there is food and water. You're going to have to drink and eat. But it's not going to be tedious. Some games, you know, you have to worry about it all the time. Essentially, in this game, you're going to start with food and water, and it'll last you probably about two weeks. So as you're playing the game for two weeks, you're not going to have to worry about it. And you will be able to just pretty easily buy or even get a spell or use some skills, depending on your vocation type, to, to get some more food and water. The reason why I wanted to introduce this is because I wanted to give you the ability to increase your regeneration rate, your health, your nutrition, and all that as you're resting. Because there's two ways to log out in this game. You can either log out and say, make me safe so that nothing can happen. Uh, you're going to age, but essentially if you're in a safe area like your house or an inn or something like that, you'll be safe and nothing will impact you. And time will essentially stop except for um, aging. So you won't heal. So if you're fully healed and you log out that way, you're just going to be safe and time's going to essentially pause for you. Now, if you log out the more unsafe way, but you're in a safe location, then you can still heal. And chances are nothing would happen to you. Unless somebody comes in for whatever reason and destroys the inn that you're at or something like that, or you decide to log out that way in the uh, wilderness, you may be attacked while you're there. The computer will take over and try to attack based on how you've told your characters to behave. Uh, automated. And I've talked about that before. You'll be able to program your guys. Otherwise, by default, the computer will just do what it kind of like what the monsters would do. So um, I'm going to give the player characters similar intelligence to the monsters. Uh, so anyway, there'll be two different ways to do that. So eating certain types of foods will improve your health regeneration and things like that. Okay, here's all these weapons and armor that I preload into the database. Okay, what do we got next? Projectile types. Weapons, I'm defining how much damage they do and what types of damage, like whether it's piercing, crushing, you know, and some do multiple. I've talked about that before. What else we got? Okay, this is going to be the, all the spells. Yep. Tons of spells, all the different magic realms. Okay, so enough about preloading. So the main game engine itself has a class called Game, game Engine which has a bunch of methods that will do things like, let's say I want to decrease 
the shop's inventory because someone just bought Excalibur. <clears throat> That's what this method is going to do. Or I'm processing when you clicked on that context option. I want to process to see what type of actions you should be presented. That's what this is doing. It's going through and it's checking and testing triggers and things. Uh, here we're inserting party members. I'm checking to see if, is this item type of bow? Is it a crossbow? So there's different things like that the code will do. Um, equipping items. You click on something to say you want to equip it. The code will actually be intelligent. You're not going to have to remove something else first, which I always thought was a pain in the butt. Like uh, I've been live streaming Mind Magic 4. You have to unequip the sword and then equip a different one. This will unequip anything that takes up that body part plus any related ones because some items do require multiple positions. Like let's say a uh, jacket. Jacket's going to cover arms, torso, back. So if you had a breastplate on and you equip a jacket, it'll take the breastplate off. If you also had, let's say, uh, arm plates on, it'll take those off as well because the jacket now covers the same spots. So there's a lot of intelligence with that. Um, there's also size dimensions to certain items like a giant or a troll is larger than a halfling, obviously. Troll's not going to be able to put on halfling armor and vice versa. So you'll have to find armor and weapons that, you know, um, can relate to your size factor. Now a troll, for example, let's say there was a two-handed human weapon. A troll may be able to use that one-handed now. Uh, so there's going to be factors like that too. Or a single-handed human weapon may be able to be used two-handed by a halfling. And the equip is smart enough to handle that. Okay, now, sometimes when you equip things, it may have some magic property on it. Like, let's say it's gloves of speed. Anytime something happens in this game that can affect your attributes, like agility, dexterity, or speed. I have a method where I'm recalculating your effective agility. So what effective agility is, is how it's actually observed in the game. So let's say your natural agility is 80, but you put on a jacket, a heavy leather jacket. It may drop your agility by 15. So now your effective agility is going to be 65. And so you'll see that on, on the uh, inventory screen. But maybe you have the skill of leather armor, like the warrior did. So the agility impact isn't going to be as much. So all those factors like that are taken into account into uh, with this method here. Let's just jump to it. So I'm at line 1803, just so I can remember to go back there. So here we go. So we're getting the equipped armor. We're calculating that armor skill bonus, like I was saying, if you have it. And let's see, are we doing anything with strength? Yes. So strength does impact how much the armor will impact your agility. So it's basically taking your strength, dividing it by 5, and then subtracting 20. So what does that mean? If you had 80 strength, there's, there's no net loss or gain for your agility loss of this armor type. If you had 100 strength, 100 divided by 5, or actually it was 100, wasn't it? Yeah, so 100 divided by 5 would have been 20. If you had 120 strength, then you're not going to lose as much. You're only going to lose, what would that be, 4, 4 less. So instead of 20 agility... No, I said 15. Instead of losing 15 agility, you might only lose 11. So the stronger you are, the less you're going to lose. Okay, so let's... Same thing with, like, um, dexterity loss and things of that nature. So now we'll just jump back to where we were. 
Let's see. Calculating effective attributes. Calculating your intelligence. Stamina, all those. Mana. Okay. Now, mana is very... Mana is your spell points. And it's calculated differently depending on your vocation. For example, priests, wisdom, empathy, and spirituality determine their mana. Whereas a thaumaturgist, it's more. It's wisdom, intelligence, empathy, logic, and spirituality. But it's less of an impact for each one. The only one that has the biggest for them is spirituality. You can see it's a 2.0 multiplier there. Logic isn't as important to the thaumaturgist. It only impacts it by 0.5% um, percent of the difference. Whereas with the priest, you can see wisdom's important, but empathy and spirituality is twice as important. And then here we got wizard, psionic, alchemist, sorcerer. They, they all have different types. Shaman, necromancer, kineticist, geomancer, evoker, enchanter, druid, arcanist, and believe it or not, even the Myrmidon, because the Myrmidon has mana that he only uses for his spiritual harnessing skill. And then if there's some any other kind of generic um, class or vocation, the, theirs is determined in this way. It's a tiny bit of wisdom, really good amount of intelligence. Logic's very important. Creativity, tiny bit. And willpower, pretty important. All right, sense of hearing. So different things are going to impact your sense of hearing. Spells, your race, all kinds of things like that. Same with sense of height, uh, sight. Do you have the scouting skill? That's going to determine how far ahead you can see things. Are you blinded? If you're blinded, your sense of sight's going to be non-existent. Sense of smell. Okay, what else we got? Calculating your hit points and all that. It's called physical health in this game. Armor skill bonus. Okay, attack speed delay. So by default, if you, like everything was neutral for you, you're unskilled, and you're swinging a weapon at someone, you get to swing a weapon once every 3.5 seconds. That's what's called the initiative. The delay is actually lowered based on your attributes or raised if you're slow so like agility has a really big impact dexterity has a pretty big impact initiative a slight impact and then speed speed's usually related to movement speed it has a slight impact so this is the attack speed delay this is not your initial initiative let me find that one Okay, here's the initiative. So the 3.5 seconds was, that's how after the initial delay, that's how many times you're gonna keep attacking every three and a half seconds. The initial delay is on top of that. So the very first time you issue an action to attack this person over here, for example, there's a two second delay before your first attack. And then it's going to be three and a half seconds after that. And so initiative attribute is the biggest impact on this. Huge impact. Agility, once again, is a good impact. And dexterity is a pretty good impact. So the lowest delay you can have right now is 100 milliseconds. So that's, you know, almost unheard of. But this is just your initial attack speed not afterwards same thing happens for if you determine you want to flee or you're going to cower um, 
a say hostility, that's what the computer is going to be doing. It, the, the life forms in this game will kind of wander around certain areas. And they will be looking for anyone that's hostile potentially toward them. Now, some will be hostile themselves. And they're, they're just looking to fight anything that comes within range. But others are neutral and some are good. And so unless you've offended them, they're, they're not going to do anything. But that's what this is doing. It's, de it's determining how much of a delay there is for them to detect you while they're looking around and trying to sense things. Okay, attack speed, what do we got? Invoke item speed, so there's, you know, delays with all that kind of stuff. Same with casting spells. Um, the casting spells is impacted by different things. Of course, initiative always for the initial delay. But then it's got dexterity, intelligence, wisdom, logic, and creativity. That can all start lowering your delay on the spell casting. Okay, so you can see pretty much a feel for kind of how the code's working with all this stuff. Um, certain skills that you use will have different attributes that the game's going to look for. Like wound treatment, for example. Empathy is very important for wound treatment. And then intelligence, logic, and wisdom is also sli slightly important. So the higher attributes you have for that, the better. So all these different skills that are going to exist in the game are going to have this kind of stuff. And I'll just balance it over time. Here's likability. So as you meet people or things you, you can converse with, it's going to determine your likability. It does so based on your personality and your reputation. And it does it based on their personality. I mentioned earlier, maybe crude dwarves like you because you're crude also. So all that codes in here doing this kind of stuff. Checking your charisma, your confidence. Checking if you have diplomacy or persuasion. Maybe prestige. Uh, so all those different skills. Okay, what else we got? This is checking the condition severity. Like let's say you get diseased. There's a severity level to all conditions. And so when a, let's say you're fighting a mummy and it diseases you. And there's also a necromancer in the same party. Necromancer might have a cause disease spell. Well, if the mummy's disease is stronger than his disease, he's not going to cast cause disease on you again unless he makes a foolish action, which can happen based on intelligence. I'm trying to make the AI realistic with intelligence. So, you know, dumb things are going to make dumb decisions. But in general, this helps me determine smart decisions for life forms when they're trying to choose their actions. So that's what this condition severity essay is doing. It's looking at the duration and how significant it is. Potential. So this potential method is looping through all the members in the party. And it's trying to see, okay, wait a minute. Is this party member dead? Because let's say I'm going to cast a fireball spell. Hey, I'm a monster and I'm going to cast it at you. You got six party members. Fireball is a little expensive with mana, but it hits an area. <clears throat> well, if five members are already dead, and there's only one left in your party that's alive, the computer's going to analyze the potential for this spell, and it's going to say, wait a minute, he, this guy's dead, skip. We're not, gonna, we're not going to give this a higher weight on the spell. Because I only find one that's here. So based on the cost of the spell and the impact, I'll probably end up choosing a different spell, something that's more single target. So that's what all this method's doing. Damage severity potential, same type of concept. It's for the AI to figure out how much potential damage it's going to do. And, and I also do it with buff spells. So a buff spell is like strengthening you. Um, hastening you. 
it's going to do it based on your vocation too. So like the computer is going to be smart. It's not going to cast like haste. Well, haste is a bad example. Let's do strengthen. It's not going to cast and cast a strengthen spell on a wizard. You know, it, it'll do it most likely on a warrior, a knight, a barbarian, somebody that's going to be using a melee weapon. So what I'm doing here is weighing the skill and bumping the scale factor up a little bit. So that'll increase the chance that this spell will be cast on that type of uh, party member. And then there's going to be other buffs like invisibility and things like that, which are kind of universal and could work for all party members. Okay, so in games you have what's called a buff, which gives you bonuses. And then you have what's called a nerf, which uh, lowers whether it's attributes or certain properties of the enemy. So that's what this method's doing. It's looking for nerf potentials like you cast a weakness spell or slow or you're trying to soften their armor. That's what this is doing. Okay. Earlier I talked about hardness of weapons and armor. There's methods in here that calculate the hardness of shields, armor versus weapons. So as you attack, you're gonna it's gonna calculate which is gonna get damaged. If you're hitting someone with a diamond shield with a hardened steel sword, it's not gonna do anything. The diamond shield is gonna take zero structure point damage. The hardened steel is gonna take a lot of structure point damage. So that's what all this is for. Same with projectiles. There's methods in here to calculate their hardness because if it's a steel tip blade hitting leather armor, it's going to uh, go through it a lot easier. Okay, what else we got here? So sometimes I need to know what the largest given attribute is for the, everybody in the party. For example, uh, strength. Let's say I'm trying to find out who is the strongest. Then I just loop through. I see is the character dead first of all, <laughs> because if they're dead or equivalent to being dead, which means destroyed, petrified, in a coma, then we're skipping them. We're not going to check them. But this is normally for certain actions or skills. And then sometimes I want to get a cumulative value of a skill or an attribute. Like let's say you have three party members that have scouting and you're searching. Then it's going to cumulatively give a scouting factor. So having three scouts would be better than having just one. I have methods to <clears throat> calculate the worth of items. And this one's pretty interesting. This is in a different this is in a different class called Game Engine Calculation. And let's just go ahead and take a look at this. So this is one of my more recent uh, methods I've implemented. And earlier I told you about a base item material bumping cost. Well, there's all kinds of other things that do too. Like I look at the purposes, I find the number of charges on it. I find ranges on weapons. I find damages. Um, the flexibility of the weapon. Like, does it give you more options? A weapon that you can sw uh, swing and thrust is more flexible than one that you can only thrust. So that'll impact the cost a little bit. So all of those types of factors I'm putting in here. And it's just formulas. It all calculate out. Um, can you throw it? Types of damages it does. Okay, and then once calculates certain base things like that, then it'll start looking at structure points and saying, okay, if it had 2,000 structure points originally, and now it only has 1,000 left, 
it's it's beat up a little bit, so it's it's not going to last forever unless you repair it. So the the cost is going to go down. <clears throat> what it's made out of, so its hardness will impact the cost. And it can quite a bit too. Like if you had a sword that's made out of bronze and then you have a sword made out of hardened steel, the hardened steel's, you know, a pretty good amount more or harder than the bronze. So that's going to bump it up. Sometimes I use exponential increases like this is to the 1.2 power other times I just do a, like a simple linear multiply hit bonus <clears throat> so hit bonus is really only important if the weapon can do good damage I mean what's if you have a crappy weapon that you can hit with all day long big deal I mean it, it's if it's not going to do any damage the hit bonus is pretty useless so the hit bonus is an example of something that happens after you calculate all the damage and everything else then it has a pretty significant exponential increase so a hit bonus of 10 percent on a weapon that does a good amount of damage is really going to boost the cost a lot same thing with a lowering cost if it has a negative hit bonus then it's going to lower the cost a decent amount, although not as much. It's not the one to the 1.8 power, it's only to the 1.2. Okay, projectiles. Because all these are determined the cost differently. Weapons, armor, projectiles. Armor, for example, we have to look at the total volume that it takes up on the body and what types of things it absorbs, like acid, burning, Chemical, cold, cut damage, fire damage, frost. It's all kinds of damage types. So it takes all that into account. And the more this armor protects you from those different types, obviously the more it's going to cost. If you have a modifier where it actually lowers your speed or dexterity, well, that's going to make it a little cheaper. Same with hardness. It's going to have a big impact. Now, does it invoke a spell? Can you cast, like Excalibur, you could cast Lightning Bolt. Or does it invoke a spell on hit? And waiting for my computer to respond. There we go. Um, is it a magic wand? Is it a magic ring? You know, so does it, does it have spells in, embedded inside it? So what I do is I look at the mana of the spell that's embedded and that's a good, good general power level determining factor to, to see what this thing should be worth. That's the main factor. Then it looks at the number of charges in it. And I do cap it because an item can potentially have unlimited charges. Like Excalibur can stone the enemy forever. It won't run out of that uh, power. But I cap it to 2,000. Otherwise, the cost would be, you know, priceless and nobody would ever, ever be able to afford it. So I cap it at 2,000 if it's a max unlimited. Otherwise, I cap it at 1,000. So exponential with the mana. And then we take it times the charges and multiply an additional times 0.75. Uh, parry, if you have the ability to parry with a weapon, it just takes that weapon's base value and gives an additional 0.1%. Shield's similar to armor. It's a little different. Powders, potions, and bombs. <clears throat> so bombs and powders you generally throw. Potions you drink. Although some powders you do apply to yourself. Uh, but similar, it, it's about all about the mana and charges. Food and drink, minimal cost. Magical musical instrument. It's similar, but magic musical instruments, just like in wizardry, they never run out of charges. And so we just default it to 2,000 max charges. And then I do lower the base cost compared to like a, a wand or something like that. Because generally, 
the magic magic musical instruments can only be used by the bard so that limits their uh, cost a little bit there so that's what this new method did but I think that's probably good enough for now you can see there's all kinds of stuff in here I'll talk about later but just to kind of give you a little more feel about the code and uh, how much progress I have tons and tons done in the base game engine so it's getting to the fun more fun and exciting parts guys so uh, I hope you've enjoyed this and if you have any questions com or comments please comment below the video that really helps motivate me so I will see you guys next time